All right, so there's part A. Part B, let's go back to the question and see what it's asking us. It says, how far, correct to the nearest meter, does the boat eventually travel as it comes to a stop? How far does it go um, eventually as it comes to a stop? Now, it's probably worth mentioning that this phrase, you know, comes to a stop is what happens in reality. The boat does stop. Um, but the actual model that we've created, an exponential decay model, the model is so, as the question itself says, greatly simplified, um, an exponential decay model, like it never gets down to velocity equals zero. You've got this asymptotic behavior, right? So that's the whole issue with using like a perfect mathematical model. Um, even though we've been ignoring resistance before and now we're including it, still there are things that are being left out, but that's okay. We can still use this model nonetheless. How do we work this out? What I'm going to do is come back to this um, set of equations here and what I'm trying to do is to solve for, well, let me just go back to the question, sorry. Um, I'm solving for how far. How far? Um, that is a question of displacement, right? So that's a question about x. I'm trying to solve for x. My final line will be x equals something or other, right? And the way that I will know what x I'm after is when the boat eventually comes to a stop. That's a velocity of zero. Now we know velocity never actually equals zero, but I have a calculus trick in my pocket that helps me work out as things approach something, even if they never quite get there. Um, and that is of course limits, right? So I'm gonna take the limit as V approaches zero. But the limit as V approaches zero of what? Go and have a look back through all of our equations. Which one is going to be the most useful? Um, is it going to be this equation here that we just finished part A with? There's no problem using it, but I don't think it's the easiest one to use because I want an x equals, right? The whole point of all of these lines of working, like these whatever, 10, 15 lines of working, was to get to a v equals. So I'm going to backtrack through all of my equations and I want you to have a think uh, through your own working, which one of these equations is the easiest to use to solve for an x equals something or other. Let me just pause for a minute. Let me see if you can work out which one might be the most suitable. And where I'm going to go, having given you a brief moment to think, is I'm gonna to go to uh, this equation right here. In fact, it's so important, I'm gonna give it a name. I'm gonna call it 1a. Why is this equation useful? Well, number one, it is actually the equation between x and v with the constant actually evaluated. So that's kind of important. I don't really wanna go much further past uh, back up that way because I'm gonna to need to evaluate c again, right? No point doing that. Um, and this equation here, as soon as I go to the next line, you can see that x term, which I'm after, I want an x equals, um, it goes up into the exponent of this exponential, right? And so it's like, oh, it's harder to get to, not easier to get to. So even though this line here, I'm calling it equation 1a, even though it doesn't have like a kind of slam dunk x equals, um, it's got it sort of separated out in a fairly easy fashion. It's not, it's not difficult to make x the subject from that equation. So that's what I'm gonna do. So from picking up from 1a, uh, the first thing I will do is I'm going to subtract log of 56 from both sides. So I'll put this x term on the left because that's where I want it in the end. And that leaves me with, this is what used to be on the left hand side, so now it's on the right. And I'm subtracting log of 56, okay. Uh, at this point, uh, what can I do? Well, uh, a couple of different things, a couple of different choices. In my brain, the first thing that's gonna be useful is, in much the same way that from this line to this line, um, I broke apart this single exponential term into two exponential terms. Uh, in much the same way, but in reverse, I'm gonna take these two log terms and combine them into one log term. So I can write log of do some nice big fat brackets here. Think about when you're subtracting log terms, go back to you know all your logarithm laws that you learned. When you're subtracting logs, that is equivalent to division of the two things inside um, the argument, I guess you could say. So that's one plus 10 V, and that's a 56 on the inside there on the denominator, okay? Uh, and that's minus X over 10. At this point, um, I'm pretty much ready to go to make x the subject. I'm going to multiply both sides, both by minus 10. So that gives me minus 10 here, log of, um, same thing. Nothing's changed there. 
One more thing before I then try and uh, pull some limits on this, right? Um, another log law, see that minus out the front there? Um, the power law for logs tells me that that minus one, I could bring it inside and make it the power up the front, or up the top rather, of what's on the inside of the log term. So this could be all raised to the power of negative one. And you guys know what raising something to the power of negative one does, it takes the reciprocal. So I'm going to write, whoopsie daisy, that 10 is still out the front there. That log remains uh, unchanged, but I'm going to flip upside down this using my log laws. Okay, and now lastly, we said, uh, you know, what we want to do is work out what's happening as the velocity tends towards zero as it comes to a stop. So I'm going to write the limit as V approaches zero. If you wanted to be really fancy, uh, fancy schmancy technical, um, we would say zero approach from the right hand side um, because what we're doing is where, um, so you know, you'd, you'd put a plus there because we're approaching it from positive values coming down because we don't know what happens from negative values being that my boat was never traveling backwards as far as I know anyway. Um, so the limit is being applied to X over on the right hand side, because that V in there, there's actually no problem with treating it as if it were actually zero. You can see what I'm gonna get is log of 56 over one plus zero. Last I checked, one plus zero is one. So 56 over one just gives me 56. Like so, 10 log 56. And if you reach for your calculator, go ahead and do that. And um, give me some decimal places, pop them into the chat, maybe give me um, three or four decimal places and let's see if you get a reasonable answer out of this. Looking for some calculator work. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, I got 40.2535 uh, something or other. And uh, the question was to the nearest meter. So as Sham and Susie have pointed out, we can round that. So I'm gonna say therefore, um, approximately, the boat comes to a stop approximately 40 meters after the finish line. That's my interpretation and me answering a worded question with words. So I hope that makes sense to you. In some ways, even though it is this sort of other category of thinking, resisted motion, um, we can kind of treat these equations just like we have um, any other equations to do with forces. It's just that the particular forces that you get have this particular behavior whereby the greater the velocity is, the greater the um, force that will be acting back on you. So the example that we just had a look at and the examples you're going to see when you go onto the calendar and you can see the questions that have been assigned, they're all to do with um, this kind of situation where like cyclists and swimmers, we're dealing with um, motion that is being um, resisted or motion that's in a horizontal direction and therefore being resisted in a horizontal direction. It will be sometimes things like this, aerodynamic um, drag um, or a friction force like traveling along the ground. We are going to wait until Friday to introduce motion that is not uh, horizontal, but vertical. So there's going to be vertical resistance, but also you've got to make that play with gravity and things like that. 